All right. Are you guys excited? Yeah. Yes. I am as well. I'm, I'm kind of, uh, okay, it's weird. I, I thought you were going to be like, eh, where's lunch, right? Um, so I know I'm in between you and lunch. Uh, however, I encourage you guys to stay um, a bit focused on this presentation, especially because it's a little bit, you know, code heavy. So if you're going to wander off of your Twitter or Facebook and whatever you have on your phone, you might lose my presentation and uh, I'll be just a sad panda. Um, all right, so um, regarding the code base, so I will be using Scala Z in my presentation. However, if you are more of a cat person, you'll be fine. Like the things are quite a similar things, similar type classes, so maybe some differences in naming conventions, but more or less it should be kind of the same. Um, so I'll be talking about Monad Transformers Library, MTL. And you guys should be like, really? We, we had that already, right? Monad Transformers yesterday, cool presentation. Um, that's the tricky part. MTL isn't really about Monad Transformers. So MTL is a library which was developed in Haskell in some prehistoric times back in the, in the 80s or whatever. Uh, MTL had Monad Transformers in it, plus some useful type classes. Eventually, Monad Transformers were moved to the language uh, the core language, and those useful type classes stayed in the MTL. So later on, when, when Scala Z came, came into life and then we had CATS, those useful type classes were ported to both Scala Z and CATS. So um, if you ever hear about MTL in Scala, it's not really a separate library. It's just those useful type classes which were ported to existing libraries like Scala Z or CATS. Um, and, and we're going to talk about those type classes. Those are a little bit of abstractions. Uh, they abstract over some patterns that you see in your code base, and they give you a little bit of sanity uh, if you're working a lot of with, mo with monads. Have you guys seen this game? Have you? Who has seen it? Okay, so I encourage you guys to play it. It's an amazing game where you basically play a CEO of a startup, a unicorn startup. Uh, the game goes uh, in a way, it, it pushes you some events, uh, like for example this one, to which you have to react, and your reaction, <laughs> yeah, I know, <laughs> I had to, sorry. Um, and your reaction um, will we'll change whether you're, you know, the happiness within your startup and the income you have within your company. Um, so we're going to do exactly this. We're going to play a little bit of startup, um, but our startup will take place in the galaxy far, far away. Uh, we're lucky because we just got a new client. Uh, it's, it's, a gov uh, it's a government contract, so we should get a lot of money. Um, so the CEO, uh, sorry, the, the um, the, our client, uh, well, he had, the storyline is basically this. He, had, he has an issue. So they had uh, a very successful monolith application, but at some point, some rookie developer came back from the conference, and he said that we should decompose that to microservices, and, <laughs> and thing, you know, things go wrong <laughs> at some point. So now they're running, you know, low of money, and, and the, the, cli the client thought they're gonna, um, they're gonna deal with that um, like what, what always governments do with taxes. So they're gonna, um, they're gonna um, take some taxes from citizens, and they need an app for that. Um, and the algorithm is, uh, is fortunately very, very simple. We we take an income, we uh, subtract five from it. Uh, that's our tax. Everything else is for the user. So we want to write this application. Tax calculator will take that income and, and, and return us the, the tax for that income. Uh, we are the startup, which was just recently founded. So we do what normally startups do uh, at the beginning of uh, being a startup. We, we acquire a, another startup. So we acquire some startup that actually they develop this function uh, minus five, which is awesome because this is like a core of our business problem, right? We, we need to subtract five from, from the integer. We're going to have that, that function. So we should be good, right? Um, so let's, let's try to call that minus five. Uh, we can actually uh, create our application. Um, let's run it. So here's the REPL. 
uh, we will run with two arguments, and holy crap, the thing explodes. Right? We get, we get for, for 10, we get some value 5, uh, but for 4, we get this you know, stack, and, and, and it's not really what we wanted. Uh, however, we are good Scala developers, and we want to embrace functional progresses. So we, um, uh, we know how to deal with that stuff, right? It, it's pretty straightforward. We, we need to kind of um, maintain the error. So one of the ideas that we could actually do would be uh, to wrap the call to minus 5 within a try. And you know, depending if that's a success, we will just give you the value within the string. If there was an error, if we had some failure, we will print out the error message. Should that work? Most probably, yeah, right? So if we call that with those arguments one more time, um, we get uh, tax 5 for 10, and we get the error message for 4. So we're good. Um, but you think about it, dealing with error this way is not the only way you could deal with errors in Scala. Why returning a try? Why returning a try at all if we could just close everything over task? We've, we've seen a task uh, just a moment ago, right? Uh, so, so here we have, uh, so here we, we just close our calculation over task and then we map over the task to, to string. Then we have this handle with method, which, which basically, um, this is like a, a partial function. So if there is an exception within your calculation, if you, if you have side effect affecting stuff within your calculations, it will, it, it will just call your function and you can handle those errors. So we are saying whatever the exception, just, just print the message and, and that will be our value. And at the very end, we call unsafe perform sync, which, which just triggers the calculation for us. Will that work? That will work as well. So, so is this the only way that we could re reason about our errors? No, like we could always also ignore the errors. Like whatever, right? I will either give you a value or none. Is that the right approach? Depends on your context. Uh, but this will, this will work as well. So I call with my arguments. If it's 10, it's 5. If I call it with four, I get none. Some of you might say, oh, this is all crap. You should just use either type. Everybody is using either type. This is the right approach to use either type. So, so this is what, what are you going to do? We could also say our income tax will either return an int on the right-hand side or will uh, give us an error uh, close within a throwable class. And this will, will work as well. If we call it with 10, we get a right-hand side. If we call it with four, we will get the left-hand side. So the question now is, which one we should really choose? Or, you know, because we, we are at this point making some decisions ahead of time. We are, we are implementing a method income tax regardless of how it's going to be used. We don't really know if we're going to need either type or task or, 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 or option or whatever. Um, you may wonder, is that really an issue? Let's see. Um, I would, I, I, let, let's try to actually implement this method, income tax, uh, where we will try to be a little bit more abstract. We will say, we will return that integer closed over some f, but we don't know what that f is. We give the power back to the user. We do a little bit of inversion of control here. The user will decide what the f will be. Can we implement that method by now? Can we? Well, not with this signature we can. Because we don't really know what f is. f is too abstract. It's just some f. Um, however, if we go to Scala Z, we will find this useful type class called applicative. An applicative has uh, one very neat method that we can use. It's called point. So what that method is doing, if you have, that, if you have instance of that type class applicative, what point will give you, it will just take your value A and it will close over that F. So now going to back to our example, if we, if we close, uh, um, if we have an income tax and we close over that, uh, we, we'll say that f is applicative, 
we can take our success into J and just call point on it, and we will get the F back. But what about the error? How can we handle the situation that we have an error? How we can close that error over F? So there's a, another type class called um, monad error. And monad error is one of those type classes I've been telling you um, previously, which are within the MTL. So monad error is parameterized by two things. That F we are interested in, and S, where S represents the type of our error message. So we will get, like if somebody gives us an instance of this type class, we will get two functions, rise error and um, handle error. We are right now interested only on the first one, the rise and error. So we will get a function that will give us f of a if we give it the error message. So, so basically, it goes like this. We no longer, we no longer saying the f is applicative. We are saying there needs to be an instance of a monad error for our s and throwable. So now, if we want to close our throwable, our e here, within the f, we just call rise and error. Because as you guys remember, this is what it's doing, basically. It's giving us that f if we give him an error. How it's working? Where is the magic? Well, we don't know, because we don't know what the f is. Somebody who will call our function income tax for an F will have to give us an instance of that type class monad error. But once we have that instance, we can call method rise and error, and we should be fine. Now you may wonder, okay, so but will this, this still compile? We, we have point from applicative, right? We, we still have this. Well, fortunately, monad error is also providing for us an instance of a monad for F. And monad is an applicative. So we get that, uh, that, that point for, for free here. And, and yeah, and this compiles. So now we can actually call our function income tax and parameterize it by error, where error is just a type alias for, this, for, for either type for this junction of throwable and A. So this is like a, you know, a little bit of synthetic sugar here. And so we can call our income tax uh, with error. We can call our income tax with task. Uh, yeah, let's see how it works. So we call run with 10 and 4, and we get 5 and the mess error message, and we get two tasks. Well, those tasks should be actually run, so that we call this um, attempt function. Attempt is basically what it's doing is uh, it takes a task and it gives you a task back, but if there was an error within it, it will give you a task not of your type A, but of either error or A. So, so if we call this right now, We'll, we will get those two uh, either messages, 5-5 five, five, and error and error. So this is awesome because now, now we give the control back to the user. Uh, the question would be, could we call with um, option or with try? Well, unfortunately, there are no existing instances of a monad error type class for option and try, but we could write one, right? So, so let's take option, for example. We will have to provide an instance of a monad error for option. So, so we would say, you know, if you rise an error, well, just return none. Uh, and if you handle error, we, don't, we, we just kind of ignore errors, so, so just, uh, just, just return original option. Um, and this will work. And we can also, so yeah, it, you know, if we call it, we get this 5-5, five, five, sum 5, or we get none. We just basically ignore the error message. Uh, we can do exactly the same thing for try. Try isn't really a monad, but it's like a monadish. Um, so, but we can still provide those those instances of for this type class. So we're saying here, you know, if you're gonna if you want to write an error, just 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 call failure. Just use that constructor here. Uh, if we handle an error, or, well, it depends. If it was a success, just return fa. If it was a failure, call that function for 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 uh, for that failure. And this compiles. It's awesome. It's not? It is. Because, uh, well, yeah, you, you can run it. It works. Uh, but it really is awesome. Because you give back the power to the user. Now he can decide. And he will know better which type he eventually wants. If you're not convinced, let me show you an example. So let's go back for a minute here to that either type, because most probably majority of, of, of you guys would choose either for handling errors, right? So let's say we have income tax. Let's go back a little bit, just ignore monad, error for, monad errors for a minute. Oh, shit, I have like, what, 10 minutes? 
crap. Um, uh, where did I start it? Is I, I started at 50. 50. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> a little bit of heart attack. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's say I have a, I have a task. Uh, I have a method environment variable which gives me that value um, close over task, and I want to. I, I will not provide you the argument ten or four. I will provide you as an argument uh, the environment variable which will hold that value. So now, if I want to run my program, it will not compile anymore because what monads do not compose. But you guys been yesterday at monad transformers talk, and you guys know what you should do, right? Uh, you should go look for this thing, this guy. This is either t. He will. He just represents uh, whatever that f is. You have like either uh, value of a and b, and it's close over that f. So you can do that magic. I just have to talk a little bit faster to to show you guys other stuff. But basically, we can do this. We can we can lift both of those monads. Task. Uh, we could lift to either t of uh, task, and we could lift either to either t of task as well. And this will compile, and this will work. Uh, just trust me, it works. So um, we call it with two different incomes, and we get all what, what we needed. However, if things get a little bit, bit more complicated, because let's say environment variable should really handle situations where you're calling this with a name that doesn't exist, right? If we call this function with an environment variable that doesn't exist, it would explode with an exception. We don't want to do that. So we are changing our function environment variable right now to uh, return us a task of option of string. So now ha we have a dirty of option t of task of something throwable and a value. It's great, isn't it? That, that's, that's how we get our sal salaries high. Um, it really isn't. It's awful. It's, it's, it's hideous. Uh, the business logic is here. Everything else is a boilerplate. I mean, if you are previous Java developer, you're good, right? <laughs> You've seen it. You're accustomed to kind of ignore all that ugliness. And I will reckon if you, if you provide any junior developer to Scala program and you show them this, they're going to be like, this is ugly. Where, where is my Golang? Um, so yeah, if we had that function income tax implemented with either type, uh, sorry, with monad error, then we can lift our original environment variable to option t, and we can call our income tax with option t, because we know right now we need option t. We don't need any heavy lifting of our whatever either type to either t of whatever of option t of something. We already know what we want. We just, we just tell that function, we want your value closed over that option t. And if you wonder if there's a type, type class for monad error for option t, well, there is. If, uh, and it's pretty simple. It's a monad error for option t, as long you have monad error for f. So you have option t for f, and f has a monad error, you will get for free uh, an instance of monad error for your option t. And it works. Uh, you know, just ignores those errors if you, if you run it with, with the values that don't exist. So our client is happy. Uh, and we move to another client. Our law department is saying there's no conflict of interest, so we're good. Um, so this is uh, Royalty, another good pay payable contract. And Princess Leia has an issue because uh, she has a bunch of those you know, very loyal rebels, but they just keep on dying. All the time they die for the cause. And at some point, you know, it's really hard to, to keep up with assembling a new spaceship to fight for your cause. Uh, so, she needs an, so she needs an app to quickly assemble a team. Yeah, like a, a quickly assemble a spaceship that will do the kind of mission that needs to be done. And we are about to write that application. So uh, quickly, the domain here, we have some guns with power. Uh, we have drive that will drive our spaceship. We take some arguments like a minimum personnel that is needed to, to actually uh, accommodate that drive and the amount of fuel that is needed, some instances of those drives. We have a, a spaceship, which basically has a name, a captain, um, uh, a drive, a personnel, which is a list of citizens, and a fuel, and a front gun, and a rear gun. And, and she needs, the application that we need to write is just the ability to assemble a spaceship and, and give back a status report. Whether the spaceship is operational, um, what's the fuel situation, and what's the power situation of the guns that we have. So well, we could actually write that pretty quickly. So uh, we, we want to keep in, in a space of functional programming. Uh, so we have this initial function in it that will just create us a spaceship for a name, a captain, and the drive. 
And, and we have uh, some few useful functions, like for example, function recruit. So function recruit takes the spaceships as an argument, and it takes a citizen, and it will give you as a, as a value back a modified spaceship, because it modifies the existing spaceship, and also a Boolean, which represents whether right now the spaceship, spaceship is operational, yes or no. So if there's a minimal number of personnel that is able to operate the given, the given drive. There's also uh, a, um, a dual function, Slack, so just you know, removes a citizen from, from personnel. Um, there's a method tank, which takes a spaceship and a fuel, and it basically tanks your, your tank with a fuel and give you uh, information whether the fu fuel, uh, whether the drive has the minimum amount of fuel to be operational as well. Uh, there's a equipped front gun and equipped rear, rear gun, just get, you know, puts the guns onto the spaceship. And we can write our program here, so we have Han Solo, we have Chewie, and we initialize our, our Millennium Falcon, we add a Chewie as a, as a, as a, as a personnel, we tank with some fuel, We've equipped with a front gun. We then change the front gun, and we equip uh, uh, a rear gun as well. And we call our, our at the end the status report, saying what is operational, the, the the stuff with fuel and all that. Um, there is an error here, though, because check this out. We actually um, we're putting antimatter blaster for for, equip, um, uh, for front gun and rear gun. But if we call that function, uh, what do we get? We get a spaceship that has the uh, antimatter blaster and a laser. Why is that? What happened? Well, we were passing all those changing spaceships around, and we forgot at the very end to put the report for S6. We just, we just called it with S5. It's a mistake that it's very easy to be made, and the compiler will be happy. What would be worse if we, if we messed up the sequence of passing the state around here? So, so it's kind of messy, and we don't want to have that. Um, there is a thing we could get from, uh, uh, from Scala Z, which is called a state. If you try to understand what state is, uh, just looking at Scala Z uh, implementation, it's get kind of messy, because you will learn that state is a type, uh, type alias for state T, and you will learn that state T is a type alias for index state, and you will go to index state and you will see this. And the first time you see it, you basically see this. So, so it's, not, it's not really helpful, right? So let me quickly introduce you guys to what, what state is, just like one on one to state. State is just a class that wraps over your function that takes some s and returns you an s and a. So, so it takes a ship and returns you a ship and something, like a boolean or, or whatever. Um, it's, it's a monad. Um, uh, it's a monad, so we need to provide to functions, map and flat map. And you might wonder how we should do that. Well, the cool thing about functional programming is the fact that you can just basically follow types. So if, for example, with map, map supposed to return a state of SB. Um, okay, so I'll just uh, you know, say state SB, and now as this, this, I will just call this apply method here, right? So it should take as an argument a function from S to SB. Okay, so let's give him a function from S, and now it needs to return a, a new S and B. Where the hell I can get B from? Well, there's only one place. I can only call G. I can call, uh, I can call G with an A. Where can I get A from? Well, there's only one place I can get A from. It's my function F. So if I call F, I will get some S1 and A. But to call an F, I need S. Where can I get S from? Well, it's over here. And now, and then finally, I need to provide a, a new uh, S1, which is here, and it compiles. And that's the only way how you can implement it. You don't really have to know what it's doing. You just follow types, and it works. It's, it's better than Stack Overflow, really. It just, you know. I wish it could be automat automatically generated. Uh, all right, so flat mat is exactly the same. Uh, I have to skip because I have a little time. So just believe me, it works. So now, now we have ability to close our function from S to SA over the state monad. And the, the, change, the change is straightforward. You just, you just replace this with that. It's not, not really a lot of magic. The cool part is your program will look a little bit like this. So now you get a for comprehension, which, which, um, which defines that recipe of what we are doing. Uh, but you no longer pass the state around. It's being passed for you. And then at the very end, you call it with initial state and, oh, sorry, <laughs> that would be expensive mistake. Um, 
Uh, and um, yeah, and it gives you that status report, and, and we're all good, and it all works, and, and we're happy. But the problem is, what happens if we have a new method, Wookie? Because we don't want to pass Chewy as a, as a value, we don't get it. We get, we'll get a personnel from a method Wookie, but now Wookie that will not give you a citizen, it will give you an either type. Either there is an error, or you have a citizen. And you want to place that in, right? What will happen? The madness. <laughs> the, uh, not, and, 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 and we're not done. There is, a, there is a status report, apparently, we need to return. And the, the, the Princess Leia asked us to close that status report within the spaceship. So whenever you call for the status report, that, that status report will be stored in the spaceship. So now we need to provide that method status report, and it's doing all that craziness as well. So if it's operational, it puts a status report. If it's not operational, it gives us an error. It's a nightmare. And we would like to kind of leave without that nightmare. There's one thing we could do. There's a little bit of sugaring that we could do. Uh, we could just you know, uh, close that over some type alias. So uh, we could say there's a, a ship state, which basically is a, a state of a spaceship. And there's a ship state error, which is a state uh, identity of spaceship of string and A. But it's just a little bit of sugaring within the type signature of a method. The madness still exists. Uh, but it works. It works. And, and the question is, should we ship it? <laughs> I'm asking you. You guys are software engineers. <laughs> yeah, I know. There's this one single rule you guys should always follow. No. <laughs> always code. And if the person who ends up maintaining your code is a violent psychopath who knows where you live. <laughs> Do you know how I got these scars? <laughs> there is, um, there is a, uh, a monad state, another type class that we could use. And I have like probably less than five minutes, so it's a... Uh, it's, it's a problem here because there are tons of slides. So let me quickly go through them. You have to provide just those two functions, but you will get an uh, additional set of functions. One of them is uh, called state. If you look at the signature, it's exactly as what we are using. It takes us S and gives us an S of A. So going from using just state to, to, uh, to have functions that, that need state manipulation, you could just say, I will return you some F. But it's not really any F. It's an F that has an instance of a monad state. And, and the only difference is that instead of encapsulating that, that function within state object, we will just call it monad state state, which will encapsulate that, that function. So for our simple example, you know, the one without Wookie and status report, we will just call our functions uh, when we will parameterize them well, simply by, by ship state, so it's just a state of spaceship. It's exactly the same thing. It's, it's, it eventually, we will get a, a, a state of spaceship, and that's what we really need here. Uh, but if somebody gives us a, a, a new method like Wookie, which returns an either type, then we can, and, and we will implement a Wookie also using a monad error, so Wookie returns some F, we don't really know what that F is, the user will know. Now the for comprehension will it, we will still have the craziness. We will still have the ADRT of ship state and all that, but all the boilerplate is contained. It's contained within the instance of the, those type classes. Your form, for comprehension is still, well, you still get the sanity because all that heavy lifting, it doesn't magically disappear, but it's in a single place within the instance of the uh, monad error and monad state which are most likely already implemented for you. So you don't really have to deal with those. And it works. And if we now ha add status report, as we had previously, when we will say we return F, and we're just saying that F can, uh, needs, to be, needs to have a monad error and monad state as well. So depending on whether the, it's operational, we will, we will return F by calling monad state state on it, or if there was an error, we will return that F by calling MR with rise and error. And it should work, but it doesn't. It basically uh, does not compile. With an error, I can absolutely understand. It's, it's a weird error. But if we make that example a little bit 
uh, a little bit uh, less complex. We will just we just say you know status report. You get some status report called called point f on it. So we just call point with from applicative. We will get the error message that is more helpful. And that error message is telling us ambiguous implicit. Because if you guys remember, we are using here both monad error and monad state for our f, and monad error extends monad, and monad state extends monad. So this is kind of crap, and, 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 and MTL is unfortunately in Scala a little bit broken. Because of that, you, you kind of cannot really use those two together. So that sucks, I just wasted 30 minutes of your time, right? And you, you could already eat your lunch. Now it's good, like there are ways to do a little bit of work around. So we could provide, we could get a little bit dirty and uh, just copy paste monad error from Scala Z, removing the extents from, from monad because that's not really needed. And then we could have like a very convenient converter saying, um, if you're looking for monad error underscore, but you have monad error for those types, then I give you the monad error of underscore. And then the, the, the status report function uh, we'll, we'll just use that monad error underscore and you should be good. Uh, and it works. And I, I'm I run out of time probably, oh sorry for that, oh crap. Um, so so uh, the, this, the monad error and monad state are not the only like two uh, type classes that you will get from, from MTL. There are different ones like monad listen and, and as a homework, I, I encourage you guys to try it out. Just, just write a function that let's say uses a writer um, uses some state and uses an either type, three different functions, then try to compose them together, leave, live through the hell of it, survive, and the next day try to implement that using uh, the MTL libraries. So monad tell, monad state, and monad error. You will be surprised. I'm almost done. Some of you guys might be wondering what happened to that startup we were you know, trying to, to run. We've been acquired by Angel Investor, and we're good. My name is Pavel Schultz. I work for Slam Data with John, which is awesome. I learn all the craziness at Slam Data. I, I'm, this is my Twitter for you guys to complain. I run a blog where I started just writing about functional programming in Scala, and there's my email. Thank you very much. <laughs>